Hi, it's Stuart Rudner from Rudner Law. And in this episode of Fire Away, we're going to be talking about technology in the workplace, cybersecurity, and all the things that people commonly do to compromise their own interests when it comes to digital information. I'm joined by Ryan Duquette, and we're going to have a long discussion about BYOD, security, confidentiality, and all the things you can do to protect your own interests. Uh, very much looking forward to our discussion today. Our topic is cybersecurity in the workplace and the digital activities of employees, uh, which could probably fill three or four hours. And I've done many presentations on technology in the workplace. And our firm has also handled many cases involving employee either deliberate misuse of technology or inadvertent misuse of technology. And in many cases, uh, disclosure of confidential information. My guest today is Ryan Duquette. Ryan is a licensed private investigator with many years of experience in law enforcement. Ryan is the founder and principal of Hexagent Consulting, a firm focused on digital investigations, cybersecurity consulting, and litigation support. So we're going to have uh, hopefully a very interesting discussion on cybersecurity. And then at the end, as usual, I'll get my chance to fire away. So Ryan, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Stuart. Thanks for having me on your show. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, I know we've had some chances to talk in the past, and uh, I know about the experience that you bring. So it should be a great conversation. Let, let's get right into it. I mean, one of the things that uh, I love, I'm a bit of a techie. People who know me are aware of that. I like trying out the latest technology. I'm not opposed to being close to the bleeding edge at times. Um, but given what I do, I also try to be mindful of the risks particularly when it comes to confidential information, which of course is critical for those of us in, in a legal practice. Uh, so I try to be mindful of that. Um, but I also see a lot of people who are not mindful of the risks when it comes to using technology. And something I've been saying for years, I mean, it was 18 years ago that I did a presentation at the Law Society in Ontario uh, on employee misuse of internet and email. And at the, the time, I mean, our concerns were essentially those annoying chain emails people were forwarding around and people going to porn sites. And we didn't have any of the issues that we're dealing with today. Um, but what the point I made was technology is great. It can allow us to do our work far more efficiently, far more conveniently, but it also always offers new and more interesting ways for employees to get themselves into trouble. That was my point 18 years ago, and I've said it over and over again since then. And now we're talking about circumstances where you know, a lot of employers give out devices like candy, you know, whether it's a phone or a tablet or a laptop. They don't take the time to properly put policies in place or tools to safeguard their confidential information or to train their employees on, on how to manage that information. They just give out the devices or they allow people to bring their own devices and they're not really taking the, the proper steps to protect their, their data. So um, enough out of me, I wanted to hear from you. What, what do you think are the most, are the biggest threats to employers in 2019? Well, thanks for that. Um, yeah, I, I think, you know, having technology in the workplace is it's so ingrained in our day to day operations. Now, uh, many of us wouldn't know what to do if we didn't have our technology. But it's it's still front and center that employers have to make sure that they're protecting their data as best as possible. And, and all these you know, devices, like you mentioned, cell phones and computers, and now we're getting into the you know, Internet of Things and other devices that we're giving our employees to use during their every single day operations. We need to make sure that we're, we're safeguarding those devices and safeguarding information um, so there isn't a, you know, uh, inadvertent leak of the information or, or a malicious, um, you know, activity from the employee to be able to take that information. Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's a huge area, and we're talking about uh, inadvertent leaks. So one of the things that we were talking about off-air that I'll mention now because it's in the headlines lately is, you know, what happens when you want to throw something away? You know, you got a brand new smartphone over Christmas, or your employer gives you a new laptop, and you're not going to use your old one anymore. And a lot of people, frankly, you know, they might be told, oh, you've got to go and wipe it, wipe it or sanitize it, and they're either too lazy or they don't want to spend the money to do it, and they throw it out with their garbage. Uh, what are the risks if you do that? 
Well, the risks if you don't properly wipe your data is, you know, A, you know, somebody else could easily uh, stumble across your data. And also the fact that a lot of the devices we use these days are, are somewhat disposable. You know, we're, we're getting new phones every few years and new laptops every few years. And a lot of times we'll take those old devices and we'll perhaps sell them. Uh, there, there's a massive marketplace out there for used devices. So I think employers need to be very cognizant of the fact that, you know, even if it's in a, an employee's own phone, um, if it's a bring your own device sort of environment, they need to make sure that if that employee does go and, and wants to sell their device, that they're following procedures to make sure that that information is not on the phone. And, and there's lots of ways you can do that. You can just Google how to wipe an iPhone or factory reset it or how to wipe your computer. And, and we've had cases in the past where somebody has been suspected of stealing company data. And when we've been uh, you know, uh, tasked with looking at the device, it was forensically wiped. So it, it, it's, it's fairly easy to do that. And you just need to look up you know, on the internet and how to wipe that device. So people are wiping their devices to cover their own tracks, but not necessarily just to protect the corporate data. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, for sure. So uh, you mentioned BYOD, which I was going to get to. Uh, what's, I mean, for, I'll tell you what, what I see now is a lot of our clients have made the move and they are no longer providing smartphones to many of their staff. They are just having a, a BYOD policy, mm -hmm. uh, which is great in many ways. But uh, what are the specific risks in that context? Well, obviously, when it's a BYOD, bring your own device environment, it's great for the employee because they don't have to carry two devices uh, or, or more. Um, and I remember days where I had to carry two cell phones. So it's, it's a fantastic incentive for employees. You know, they'll get a, you know, a monthly fee or whatnot for, for that phone. But from the employer perspective, they need to make sure that they have the management of that data properly set up before they allow the employee to you know, start using company data on that device. Um, and again, there's, there's a variety of different management tools that you can use on these devices. But employers need to have very strict policies and procedures when it comes to a BYOD environment, because there's a lot of privacy, you know, situations there that if that device ever needed to be looked at in the future for any sort of investigation or whatnot, that the employer has the right to be looking at that device, you know, knowing that there's going to be uh, employee personal information on the device as well. Yeah, you hit on a couple of, of really important points there. So, so first one is you talked about before about having a policy or, or a requirement mm -hmm. that employees will wipe a device, for example, before they sell it or, or toss it out. Uh, but how can an employer enforce that policy? Well, again, there, there's uh, uh, many tools out there that you can use as an employer uh, to, to manage um, you know, your phone. And you can have you know, certain areas on your device set up that you can remotely wipe if you were the employer um, and you can get rid of that environment. You know, a lot of employers now that are using a BYOD environment are using a lot of cloud-based technology, mm -hmm. Office 365 and, and other aspects like that. So you know, they, can, they can then lock down or lock the employee out of that you know, cloud-based environment or remove their access to those cloud-based locations if need be. And they can also remove access to other company um, you know, information that's based out of the company that the employer or employee might be accessing via those devices. So how can the employer know though? Let's assume that I'm working for ABC company and they have a BYOD policy. So I have my Samsung phone and I've now got email and I've got access to everything on uh, Google Drive, let's say with all the corporate information. And at Christmas, someone gave me a new phone. So now I'm just gonna give this one to my nephew. Uh, mm -hmm. How can the employer even know about that to make sure that it's wiped before I do so? Well, it's really challenging. And, and this is where, you know, we really see the difference between larger enterprises and, and small and medium businesses. You know, a lot of larger enterprise environments have very strict regulations and policies and processes and tools set up to allow their employees to use their own devices. The challenge that we see a lot of times is with small and medium businesses that don't have these larger enterprise tools built into their environment and they're just you know handing or you know telling their employees that they can use their own devices and log into the you know the the organization's um, environment um, so it's very challenging for employers to know so they need to sort of keep on top of that as well and make sure that they they understand where their assets are and where their environment and, and data is going to right if you know that you've got an employee that's accessing your company environment on their own device, you need to make sure that you know that that employee has that phone at any given time and sort of keep checking into that. 
What about even things like passwords? You know, I, I know we're, we're always being told you need to have password to protect your phone. It shouldn't be, you know, one, two, three, four. Uh, and I know most organizations have a policy which says that. Yeah. Again, is there a way to enforce that? I mean, I know I, I should. I know there are some ways because I've seen it before where I get notifications saying your you know, firm policy is that you have to have a password. Yours doesn't have one. But is there a way to, to actually force someone to password protect their phone? Well, yeah, absolutely. And again, uh, from from the phone itself, you know, you would have that baked into the policy that the employee has to follow, you know, these strict, you know, requirements for their phone and, and having a password on the physical phone itself would be, you know, a number one requirement that they would have to do. Obviously, you would also have passwords to be able to log into any services that they would be using, you know, logging into the employer's environment or Office 365 or any sort of other cloud environments, you would have a password for that as well. And as the employer, you can set up certain admin, uh, you know, regulations that the employee has to meet. Obviously, changing passwords is a big one. You know, there's been a lot of changes lately with, you know, how often we have to change our passwords. So that's good news for employees and employers. They don't have to require this every 60 day change or whatnot. Um, and, And there's a lot of tools baked into the you know, environments that we're using in our, in our workplaces that allow us to do that. Office 365 is a great example. You know, they've got an admin portal where you can go into the admin and require that everybody has to change their password at a given time, or you can set up different time regulations when they have to do that. Got it. And I want to, I want to stick with the BYOD uh, topic for a second, but I'll come back to the situation where it's a firm owned uh, device, but in the BYOD context, I think a lot of people, and we see this all the time where people come in and they assume, okay, it's my phone. So my employer can't touch it. Basically they can't see it. They can't see what I'm doing, et cetera. And of course the law is never quite that black and white. Mm -hmm. Uh, But what have you seen in, in, in terms of circumstances where, an employer has a BYOD policy, but they want to be able to check and see what the employee is doing with their device. Well, I think a lot of it comes down to why the employer wants to see that device. Is it an internal investigation? Is the employee suspected of doing something? Um, and also the policies and procedures, do they have any? We've had lots of situations before where small businesses have you know, started up a BYOD environment for their employees and given, you know, allowed them to use their own devices. And then they've had an internal investigation, but they didn't have any policies and procedures <laughs> saying that they were able to access those devices to look at the, the, the company data that's on those devices when they wanted to. So when it came time for the employee to hand over their device, they said, well, I I don't need to. I I, I didn't know that I had to, you know, hand over this device. I didn't sign anything. I didn't know there was any regulations around this. So it's really important that employers, you know, have those policies and procedures in place uh, before, you know, they, they allow the employees to access company data on their own devices. So then if needed down the road, if they need to look at those devices, you know, they can they can point to that policy and procedure and say, look, you signed this. You knew uh, that there was a possibility we need to look at this information. Yeah, you, you've hit on one of my pet peeves, which is employers who either don't put po- proper policies in place or they have policies, but they don't tell anybody about them. And, and I can't tell you the number of cases we dealt with, not just on, on cybersecurity issues, but just, you know, safety or anything else where we've had clients who want to impose discipline or dismissal. And the reality is the employee was never even told that that, that's what the rules were, let alone given a chance to comply with them. So we see it all the time and and we've helped a lot of clients navigate through that. And of course, one of the major things that, you know, we do at Rudner Law is put the policies in place so that, you know, A, we help them draft the policies so they're effective. B, we help them implement the policies so that everyone's aware of them. And the employee can't turn around at some point in the future and say, I had no idea, which is often the defense. You know, the, the defense is usually not, I didn't do it, because often we have the evidence. The defense is often, I didn't know I couldn't do it, uh, which is very different. Uh, and so in this context, we're still talking about BYOD, but even when it's uh, when it's a cor- corporate property, there has been a lot of debate uh, within the courts over many years about the right to privacy. Uh, and the courts have gone back and forth somewhat. And uh, we used to always take the position that if it was a corporate device, you know, let's say a corporate laptop, that the company had the right to ask for it back, to search it, to see what the employee has been doing. Um, but even in those cases, there have been, in those circumstances, there have been cases where courts have said there was a limited right to privacy. For example, if the company gives a person a laptop and essentially says, this is yours to use for work, but they're also allowed to use it essentially and treat it as their own, 
courts have said that there is a right to privacy there. And you know, there's been some cases we can talk about if we have some time. But my point here is, even if it's a company device, it's still really important for employers to make it clear to the employees that they don't have that unfettered right to use it without review. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you what we've been doing. You know, I've been drafting these policies for years now, which essentially say you have no right to privacy. I've actually been putting, putting plain English wording at the end of the policy, usually in bold, which essentially says, if you don't want us to see it, don't put it on our device. You know, I've put it as simple as that. And it's going to be really hard. And it has been. We've had a couple of cases already which didn't get to trial, likely because the employer employee knew they had a bad case. It's going to be really hard for the employee to say, I had no idea, because you can't get any more simple than that. Um, but in your, your, your circumstances, I know we talked about this a bit off, uh, off air before the show. Uh, have you had situations where you were sort of retained to, you know, search uh, a company property, and then there was some legal maneuvering where the employee tried to object and fight that off? Yeah, a little bit, a little bit. I, I just want to step back here one second as well. You were talking about is how it's really important for companies to have these policies in place. The other thing I think that's really important is for them to make sure that those policies are updated. We've had a lot of uh, situations in the past where employers, they did have policies in place, but they were so outdated that they involved technology that you know w was so outdated and, and didn't allow the employee to do what they can do now on their devices. You know, They were using older phones that didn't allow them to you know maybe get email but that was kind of about it but really not get into the web or, or whatnot <laughs> or a lot about other applications so they need to make sure that those policies are continually updated and signed off again by the employee that know that you know these new technologies allow you to do more on these devices as well so I just want to put that out there but yeah, yeah we have had cases before where you know we've been brought in um, you know by an organization to look at an employee's device be it a bring your own you know device their own or an, an employer's device and we have had the employees say, well, wait a minute, you know, I've got personal information on there. So, you know, we're being directed by, you know, legal counsel and the organization as part of our investigations. But I think it's really important that the, the organization focuses their investigation. You know, we just can't go into a device and start looking everywhere for anything. Right. We're very focused on the scope and what we're you know, needing to look at for this investigation. And that's all we look for. You know, if it's not involving pictures or things like that or videos, we're not even looking at that. We actually exclude that from our case. So we try our best not to you know, go over any privacy you know, um, you know, regulations or anything like that or the privacy of the employee. Yeah, that's a great point, Ryan. I mean, you're right. A lot of times when these searches are challenged, it's not so much the fact that there was a search, it's the scope of the search. And if it looks like the company is just sort of running roughshod over the employee's rights and taking everything, it's far more likely to be tossed out. Whereas if, you know, as you're saying, there's an appropriate scope and you're not going beyond what's necessary, courts are going to be a lot more understanding, especially, and I hate to say this, but it's, it's often true. You know, the ends often justify the means. And mm -hmm. it, it, you know, there's a lot of cases where, the evidence shows that the employee was engaged in wrongdoing. And courts are going to be a lot more sympathetic to the employer conducting a search if it's clear this person was basically acting in a way they shouldn't have been, as opposed to an in innocent individual who's now had their entire lives you know, exposed to, uh, to their boss or whoever the case may be. So, but that's a great point. And obviously, you know, you're trained in this. So uh, you obviously understand the legalities, but also how to do it properly from what you're saying. Well, I think that's the other aspect as well is that we, we've had a lot of situations where internal IT or, or somebody else in the organization will start their own investigation into the device and they'll just start looking through the device everywhere to see you know, what this employee was doing. And, and oftentimes we'll turn around and say, that's not the best way to conduct an investigation. Obviously you need to you know, have HR, legal, you know, uh, senior management sign off in this inv investigation and have a very defined scope. And then you can bring in experts such as us to, to do this in a forensic manner. Um, so we're protecting the evidence. It, it's not a good idea to just open up a laptop or device and just start looking through it and then copying things all over the place. Um, you know, you could inadvertently, you know, be opening, changing documents on there. Um, but a lot of times the, the employer is somewhat times emotionally involved in the investigation. So they're, they're trying to look everywhere across the devices and, and that could sometimes get into some privacy issues.
Yeah, I mean, that's a great point that I was going to get to. So thank you for mentioning that, Ryan. I mean, I see this all the time where we have corporate clients call us and they suspect that an individual is, is copying confidential information. They're taking customer lists, uh, either because they can see they're forwarding the emails to their Gmail, for example, or putting on a USB key, whatever it is, there's a, a suspicion. Uh, but then they conduct the amateur investigation and they go in and they start you know, doing a, a search um, of the computer and they're opening documents and they might be printing documents or saving documents, copying documents. And you will understand this, of course, far better than I do, but I have some knowledge of the fact that the metadata, which is the data about the documents, gets changed even when you open a Word document and then close it again. Uh, and sometimes I've had cases rise and fall on when a document was created or when it was edited. And so as soon as you open that document, it becomes much murkier as to when the editing took place and, and who did it. Um, mm -hmm. But I'll tell you, I see this all the time where you know, we get the call and the employer has suspicions and I tell them they need to call someone like Hexagent and have this done properly so the data is preserved so that if this thing does go to court, you will have evidence that you can put in front of a judge. Uh, but then either they don't want to wait or they don't want to incur the costs and they do it themselves. Mm -hmm. And in most cases, that data uh, or the evidence, I should say, is destroyed. You know, you may have the evidence for purposes of negotiations and discussions, but I've often had to tell clients that, look, if this thing goes to court, that is not going to be admissible as evidence because you basically trample all over it. Yeah. Yeah. And we've even had situations in the past where, you know, the employer has started an investigation by having, like I said, their IT person or, or somebody else in the company start looking for evidence on the computer, gathered what they thought was sufficient, you know, maybe just saving the documents or, or emails somewhere. And then they've repurposed that laptop and then given it to somebody else in the organization because, you know, they're, they're a small organization and the cost to go out and buy a new system and set it up might be too costly. So they've given that you know, laptop for, to somebody else to use. And then they realize when this is going to go to litigation after, you know, eight months or a year that the evidence that they, you know, had wasn't sufficient. So they call us in at that point and it can be really challenging at that point to, you know, make sure that the evidence that we're looking at on that system hasn't been overwritten and, and whatnot. So it's, it's incredibly important to preserve the evidence up front. Um, you know, taking a, taking an image of it or, or saving it in a forensic manner that can be used for any sort of litigation or court purposes down the road if needed. And a lot of times we'll just preserve that evidence and it's never needed. Um, but we've captured it, uh, we've preserved it in a forensic manner, um, and, and we've never had to look at it. But we know that it's safe and it's done in the proper proceedings. Yeah, I mean, I've had that situation. Actually, the last time I was uh, fortunately on, on, I was acting for the employee. And it was great because uh, our client was accused of all sorts of confidentiality breaches, et cetera. Mm. Um, and the bottom line was uh, we got to call them on it and make the point that they did not have evidence. And we were able to get out of that case mm. for far less than it should have cost because the employer had no way to go to court if they wanted to. And Rob, I see you're holding up a question. So I will, uh, we'll get to that in a second. But, but the point here is that because of the fact that the employer rushed and didn't want to pay someone like yourself, Ryan, to get proper evidence, mm -hmm. push came to shove. Uh, they knew they could never go to court and they tried to bluff. Uh, but the reality is we called the bluff. And at the end of the day, they had to basically walk away with a tail between their legs because they would never have, have succeeded in court. So mm. um, I've seen that happen so many times. And one thing that, you know, one thing we do with our corporate clients is we put together, um, we, we spoke a couple of days ago in the prep session for this, uh, this show. Uh, I've never had a name for it, but I'm going to call it our digital emergency kit. Uh, because what we've done with clients is essentially put together a package of if there is a digital emergency, if you think an employee is taking confidential information or disclosing it inadvertently, uh, here's basically what you need to do. You, you know, break open the package and you can contact someone to run your law, someone like yourself, Ryan. Uh, if there's going to be PR implications, then you've got a PR person and you've got a checklist. You've got a plan mm -hmm. of exactly how you're going to handle it so that the evidence is preserved, so your legal position is preserved. Uh, mm -hmm. So we've done that and now I've got a name for it. So thank you, Rob, for inspiring me to do that. But we've now got a name for this. We've done this with many clients and it's helped them because otherwise it's always Friday at a quarter to five when this thing breaks and it lands on the desk of someone in HR and they say, oh my God, what do we do? And everyone panics. And usually when you panic, of course, you end up messing things up. So mm -hmm. now you have something you can look at when that lands on your desk. 
Yeah. And I would even extend that one step further. We've had situations before where a you know employee was suspected of you know stealing company data and they were a, a you know remote employee. They worked from home. And by the time they the employer got the laptop back, and I mentioned this before, it was completely forensically wiped. There, there was nothing on the system. And it would have been very timely and costly to, to even try the recovery of, of that data. Uh, the person who, who, who you know, deleted it obviously did their their uh, research ahead of time. So what we've done is we actually assist a lot of our our, our you know clients with coming in ahead of time and, and forensically preserving uh, any evidence for people that have access to to you know high value intellectual property for the company. You know, we'll come in at random times, um, you know, a few times a year or whatnot, and we'll we'll forensically preserve all that data, and the, the company can either you know hold onto it or we can hold onto it, and then if if ever needed down the road, it's needed for any sort of investigation. We we've got that information. We're not worried about then scrambling at the last minute or you know worried that the person is going to delete it. Now it didn't look very good in, in you know the eyes of the court that the person deleted their entire laptop, um, right. but that's a whole other story. We we didn't have any evidence to work with in that matter. Yeah, and I would never tell a client to uh, to do that, and unless you know the alternative is far worse, which is letting the data yeah. stay there. Yeah, uh, but in that case, they're obviously in a bad position already. Uh, so I want to come back to the question we have. But uh, so you were talking about the situation, which I think is a great idea, where every now and then you're coming in, getting a snapshot of the data. Uh, would you do that in a BYOD context as well? We we can again. It depends on the policies and procedures of the um, of the of the employer. Right. If the if the employee signs off that yes, they can come in and they can forensically preserve their you know their own personal device, then then that's up to the the, the you know the policies and procedures that are in place. Um, a lot of times, the situations where we're dealing with a BYOD device, you know, we're not looking at it. Um, you know, the the employer is just holding on to these in, in a forensic manner, and they're putting them off in storage somewhere, so they've got access to this information. Um, you know, if, if needed down the road. But it's a little bit of a more concern there because there's obviously private information on those devices as well, like we said before. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, so Rob, if you could hold up that uh, that question again, that would be great. We'll uh, we'll get around to it. So thank you for the question on Facebook. Are IT policies enough with BYOD or should employers just not allow BYOD at all? Uh, hmm. Great question. Uh, so thank you for sending that in. Uh, I mean, I think the reality is it's it's almost impossible at this point to say ban BYOD. And I don't think, and, and Ryan, I'd love to get your thoughts on this as well. I don't think there's a reason to do that. I think you, know, you said it, I've said it many, many times, policies are critical. Mm -hmm. And as long as they're properly drafted and properly implemented, they will save the day. You know, They will allow the employer to do what they need to do to be able to protect their data. Uh, that's my view from a legal position. And this is where I see most of our clients, unfortunately, go wrong is they don't have proper policies. They either find a policy online or they copy it from someone they know. And they don't even really take the time to make sure the policy applies to their work situation. Uh, or maybe they have us draft a really good policy, but then they don't implement it. And when I say implement, I also mean maybe sure everyone's aware of it because again the easiest way for someone to try to avoid discipline for breaching a policy is to say they were never told about the policy if you have good policies if they're implemented well then i think byod is viable uh, but ryan i'd love to get your take on that yeah i i, I beg to differ a little bit there um the, the challenge that we see is a lot of the policies and procedures that we see are in relation to using the device you know you shall not do this or you shall do this but the problem that we run into is those policies don't address the security of the device that they're using. And it's really sometimes very challenging for the organization to make sure that their employee is securing the device as much as possible, hard hardening that device, right? Are they, you know, updating the operating system on that? Are they patching their system? Are they using, you know, um, other applications on the device that are, are insecure? So that can be a little bit more challenging in, in a BYOD environment and, and a lot more challenging for the employee to, or employer to sort of keep up with all of their employees using these different devices, if it's an iOS device or an Android, you know, and making sure that everybody's following um, sort of, you know, cybersecurity practices and, and, and hardening these devices as best as possible. You know, we, we run into a lot of situations as well where the uh, company lets people use their own devices, but will also let them go off and use open Wi-Fi at a Starbucks and whatnot. But they don't use, they don't have anything on that device to help protect them when they're using, you know, that open Wi-Fi. So again, um, you know, depending on 
the devices and whatnot, it can be a little challenging for the, the, the organization to make sure that everything is implemented in the same way to protect that company data. Now, I think those are great points, Ryan. I'm not sure we disagree, but I think you've probably said it better than I did, which is that uh, if you're going to have the policies, you've also got to have proper procedures in place to, to yeah. safeguard the data. It's not just what can you do, it's how should you be doing it. And the, and the Wi-Fi you gave is a perfect example. I mean, I think, I'm, I'm guessing 95% of people out there would, you know, without even a second thought, go into Starbucks and use the Wi-Fi and log into their corporate network and download or view very confidential information. Um, and just because it's Starbucks, I mean, maybe it is a legitimate network or maybe it's somebody fishing, but either way, um, it's not secure. So you're right. And that's where, that's where someone, you know, we should probably talk after the show uh, because we draft a lot of policies for our clients and we try to make sure they're protected. Uh, but I'm sure there are a lot of things we've never thought of that you could help us with. So drafting the policies, we should go to someone like you who sees you know, what happens when, when things are not done properly. Well, I always say, you know, what, what's easier to, to manage, right? Is it easier to manage an, an employee having their own device and using, you know, accessing your company's data? And then you have to then make sure that they're doing all these things and complying to all these, you know, updates or security patches or whatnot. And that can be very timely, right? There's a lot of updates that come out. Uh, you know, Microsoft comes out with updates every single week and all the applications we use come up with update, updates, or is it easier for you just to you know buy your employee a phone, right? And then then you can make sure that you know that the, your IT person or your managed IT person is is doing those updates continually on all the devices all at once. You know, I, I think it's easier to to do that rather than you know having all these different devices all over the place um, and you're not sure what's being updated on them. And if we do that, though, are we, are we back to everyone carrying two phones around? Well, maybe, maybe, um, you know, that, that, that's the, that's the challenge there. Right. So, um, I think it depends a little bit on your environment. You know, some people are able to, to use, you know, their company device, but they can still make phone calls on it or, or whatnot. So again, it's, it's whatever people are comfortable with in the organization. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And I think if that is a situation, I mean, I think for individuals, I'm amazed at how many people keep really private personal information on company smartphones. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's one thing if you're out and about and you take pictures because that's your camera, um, but then you should take them off the phone. Uh, but I've seen people who have, you know, very, very intimate either pictures or data on company phones and then they're let go. And of course, what happens in the termination meeting is someone from HR or from IT says, hand us over your phone. And then they panic because I've got all this, you know, even if it's not confidential information, it's got all their contacts on there mm -hmm. and they are going to lose all their friends' contacts. So um, it's critical, critical for people to understand that if it's not your phone, you need to make sure your, your personal information is not on it or that you have some other way to access it if the phone is taken away from you one day. Um, mm -hmm. And that's probably a, a good segue to the last thing I wanted to talk about because I know we're already uh, a little bit after one o'clock and I don't want to go uh, too long. Uh, but I think it's really important we talk about the end of the employment relationship. Uh, which obviously two contexts. One is the termination where it's within the employer's control. The second is the resignation where it's within the employee's control. Mm -hmm. So start with the, the employer's side. If you're an employer, uh, before you, you decided to let somebody go, what should you be doing from an IT perspective before you actually call them in and, and tell them? Well, obviously, you want to look at what information they were accessing and where they have, you know, accessibility into your organization, right? And, you know, there's a lot of cloud applications, like I said before, where we're accessing from our devices, and you have to make sure that you're going to lock all of those systems down. You also need to, you know, know what, you know, devices your you, the employee has, you know, are, are there USB devices that you gave the employee that aren't accounted for? Are there other, is there other activity, you know, contained on the system of other USB usage that you don't know about? So sometimes we'll come into organizations when they're thinking of, of letting somebody go and we'll do a very cursory search on their computer just to see, you know, some of the activity that was going on. Is there any evidence of, you know, information being shared to, to other personal email accounts or, or, or whatnot? So, you know, having more knowledge is better before you want to um, you know, terminate that employee. I think it's easier to manage, you know, the potential loss of, of your company intellectual property before you let the employee go rather than waiting until they're out the door. And then, you know, you may need to employ other methods to try to get that information back. Yeah. Uh, and you'd be amazed because we often have people come in for consultations after they've been let go. And, you know, I usually make them wait a few days because usually they're far too emotional and 
you know, within a day or so. Uh, but it's amazing how many people come in and they're still getting their company email three or four days after they were let go. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Or, or they're able to get into the log into the environment. Um, cause a lot of times those systems, you know, they, they'll, they'll set up the employee to be removed or it might be every week or every two weeks that that system sort of recycles itself. So, uh, there's, I've seen a lot of situations like that in the past. That's kind of scary. Now, Rob's holding up a question, which Ryan has addressed to you. I don't know if you, can you see that? Um, if not, I'll read, I'll read it to you. If sure. It sure. Uh, so Ryan, and again, this is from Facebook. Ryan, is there a mobile device management system that you recommend to wipe company data from phones and laptops? Well, again, I think it depends on the size of your organization. Um, you know, if, if it's, I, I can't recommend, I'm not, you know, here to, here to tout any single <laughs> right. you know, device management or, or a certain product, but, you know, it depends on if you're a larger scale organization and you need to do all of a whole bunch of them at once or manage a whole, uh, you know, fleet of devices all at once, or if you're a much smaller organization and you just have a few devices that you have to um, manage. So, you know, I'd be happy to, to chat with anybody offline about this, but there's sort of a few parameters here that I'd have to know a little bit more about to, to come up with a better answer. Uh, fair enough. And we're, yeah, we're certainly not asking you to come on and promote uh, specific products. <laughs> the last thing I'll ask you about is we talked about, you know, the termination. Uh, and that's the situation where the employer has the time to prepare and get everything lined up. Yeah. Um, but what about when your director of sales comes in again, it's quarter to five on a Friday, uh, comes into HR and says, here's my resignation. I'm leaving. Uh, yeah. you know, yeah. I've seen it from a legal perspective where everyone gets thrown into a tizzy. Uh, and we, uh, again, we often work with our clients to put together a, a package. So they're prepared for that situation. But from the IT perspective, they've now just, you know, this is someone who has all of your customers contacts on their phone. They've now told you they're leaving, uh, what, what do they do from the IT perspective? Well, I think this is where it's really important for, you know, management to, to take a quick look at those systems to see what was being used and, and to know what devices the employee actually had access to. We, we've had lots of situations in the past where that exact thing happened. A sales manager, you know, resigned from a company um, and then, then went off and, and joined another company. And all of a sudden there was, you know, suspicion that they were using contacts or, or the, 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 the first company that they were with started to lose business. Um, and then litigation got involved and, and then they called us in to look at those devices. Um, and it was much later down the road. So often I think if somebody, you know, is resigning, um, it, it could be valuable, you know, to have somebody, you know, a forensic person come in and take a look at those devices and say, there's evidence here that suggests that, you know, they were plugging in USB devices that you don't have in your possession. Maybe it was their own USB devices, copying information over or, or whatnot, right? Um, and, and to make sure that they haven't taken stuff home with them and they're going to use it in the future. Now, that's a great point. And one thing that's important for employers to understand is often confidentiality is a really, it's really the only thing that someone still owes you after they leave. You know, we often get calls from employers, uh, their, their current clients or potentially new clients who say, our director of sales just left. They went to our competitor. We think they're taking all of our clients and we want you to go and you know, file an injunction tomorrow morning. Uh, and I have the unfortunate job of telling them that unless they signed a non-competition clause, which is enforceable, and most of them are not, or they signed a non-solicitation clause, they have every right to leave, go to your best or worst competitor, depending on how you look at it, and start calling all of your clients right away. They are perfectly within their rights to do that. What they can't do is use your confidential information. So to your point, Ryan, you want to make sure that confidential information is secure. Otherwise, you, re you really are giving away the farm. Mm -hmm. So from a legal perspective, you know, we work with our clients to put in place strong restrictive covenants, either non-solicitation clauses or non-competes where they will be enforced. But in Canada, they're usually not enforceable. So the non-solicitation covenant is, is the better way to go. And then, you know, we need someone like you, Ryan, to make sure the data is, uh, is protected as well. Otherwise, it's just far too easy for someone to walk across the street with their laptop uh, and all the data or like you were saying before, use a USB key. You know, it used to be, you know, I'd, I'd handle cases where someone would have to go into the office, you know, at three in the morning and they'd be at the photocopier and looking over their shoulder, hoping no one's going to come down the hallway. Uh, now, of course, it's just so easy to grab a USB key, plug it into your laptop uh, or you're on your phone and copy all the data from, you know, the corporate server onto Google Drive. It's so easy. Um, you need to make sure this is all locked down. So that's 
yeah. obviously where you guys come in. I, I, I like to tell a story when I do presentations on this topic that, you know, I, I have a friend who, uh, you know, worked for a U.S. based company, but it was a uh, Canadian employee and worked for a very long time for this for this organization. And they, the uh, internal size of their laptop wasn't very large. So they asked the company can I buy a, a USB drive and, and download everything from the server? So when I'm doing my work, I'm not constantly having to move things around. And, and the company said, yeah, for sure. So they went out and bought a, a very large two terabyte drive and literally pulled everything down from the server, continued working for the company for, for some time, for years, and then resigned and, and realized after another year had gone past, wait a minute, I'm sitting here with a two terabyte drive that's chocked full of that old company's data. Um, Right. So, and, and the company never asked them about it. They, they, they obviously didn't keep track of anywhere that this employee had bought this device and downloaded everything and, and didn't know. So, you know, luckily this, this friend is, is, is trustworthy and contacted the company and said, Hey, I found this hard drive. Um, you know, I've got a friend who can forensically wipe it for me. Is that sufficient? And they said, yes. But I always go back to, you know, what Ronald Reagan said is, is trust, but verify. Right. We need we need to place trust in our employees that they're doing the right thing. But sometimes you need to verify that they're not walking out the door with your confidential information. <laughs> uh, I think that's a first for fire away. I don't think we've ever quoted Ronald Reagan before. <laughs> Thank you for that. Uh, but great point. And it gets back to a point you made earlier, which is it's really important that organizations have up to date lists of the technology they're giving their employees. And I see it all the time where somebody's let go. And, you know, ideally what you want to put in the termination letter is you have to return all company property, which includes, and you list it line by line. But in many cases, when I push my client to say, what do they have? The answer is, well, we're not quite sure. They've got a phone. They may have a tablet. They may not. Uh, but no one really knows. And so ideally you want to know there's a phone and we gave you a charger and a laptop and two USB keys whatever the case may be, but it's amazing. And the, the story you were telling about the two terabyte hard drive, I don't know if you and I were on the same file and didn't know it, <laughs> uh, but I had almost the exact same situation where this person had a hard drive belonging to the company and you know months and months had gone by and the, clearly the company was never going to ask for it back. But yeah. fortunately, that I, I, person I think it's really back. important nowadays, you know, with, with all the, the, the digital aspects of our lives and, and the amount of you know, information now that companies have digitally, I think it's really important for organizations to just build a, a, a corporate culture of security. When they bring somebody in to hire somebody, I think they need to say to them, listen, we take security of, of our information very, very seriously here. And we're going to be, you know, implementing policies and procedures, but other things as well to make sure that our information is safeguarded. Then the employee works for however long they work there. And then, you know, when there's an exit interview, they need to ask that employee, you know, did you, you know, inadvertently or, or you know, maliciously plug in, you know, a hard drive and take things or, or email it to yourself, actually come out and ask them during the exit interview. You know, um, and I know exit interviews are sometimes, you know, a little softer than that to try to find other things out. But, you know, we've had a lot of uh, organizations that have just come out and asked the employee about that. And, and it wasn't a malicious thing. They went, oh, yeah, I, I remember it. I did buy that hard drive. I'll bring it back in tomorrow and give it back to you. Perfect. Problem solved. Right. So building that corporate culture of security right from the start, from the finish is really, really important. Yeah, I think that's, that's a great point. And then adding to that, having the right policies and procedures in place and having that uh, emergency preparation kit uh, or digital emergency kit ready. I think those are the, the key things employers should be doing. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're, we're almost at 115. So Ryan, I won't, uh, won't take up more of your time and I will get to my, uh, my rant, my chance to fire away in, in a moment. But first, I, I really want to thank you. I mean, that was Great. I think hopefully in both employers and employees can take a lot away from that discussion. Uh, and obviously, if you have more questions for Ryan, he can be reached at uh, www.hexagent. That's H-E-X-I-G-E-N-T.com. Uh, and I know Ryan, you'll be more than happy to uh, to help people out. So feel free to uh, to reach out to him. But Ryan, thank you so much for being part of Fireway today. Thanks so much. It was, that was a great discussion. And I could talk about this with you forever. Um, it's always always great. So thank you so much. Okay, well, now I get my chance to, uh, to fire away. So in episode 12 of Fire Away, I had Ryan Paquette with me. We had a great discussion. Ryan Duquette, I'm sorry, Ryan. Ryan Duquette on the show talking about cybersecurity. And uh, people who know me know that I am a bit of a techie and I love the latest technology. Um, but what I've been saying for years now is that technology is a wonderful thing. Uh, it allows us to do our work more efficiently, more conveniently. But it also gives employees more 
newer and more interesting ways to get themselves into trouble, which is frankly great for guys like me because I get to deal with the fallout and it keeps us busy. Uh, but it's amazing how both individuals and corporations just don't seem to fully take account the risks that technology brings. So my, my pet peeve I want to talk about today is people underestimating techno technological risks and how they can impact your interests, whether you're employer or employee. Um, and, you know, I've been saying that, as I said, for my, almost my entire career, uh, which, as I was reminded recently, come this February, I'll be 20 years at the bar. So 20 years, most of which has been practicing employment law, both for, for employers, employers and employees. So I've seen both sides. But back when I first started making those comments, there were no iPhones. There were no iPads. Laptops were heavier than the desk I'm sitting at right now. Um, and things have changed dramatically since then. Now everything is cloud-based. And if I pick up my, my phone right here, I can access every single file in this firm, every document in this firm on my phone. Things have changed. What hasn't changed is that people are still finding new ways to get into trouble. And they're not taking into account all of the risks that you have when it comes to technology. And what am I talking about? From an individual perspective, people don't seem to understand that if your employer gives you a laptop, a tablet, or a phone, they can see what you're doing. They can review your Google searches. They can check your email, even if it's your personal email. You know, so people say, well, I'm not dumb enough to, you know, send personal things on my company email address. Okay, but you're sending it from your Gmail on your company phone. They can see that. Or I've had people explain to me that, no, don't worry, I deleted the email as soon as I read it. So they'll never be able to see it. It's gone now. Or they can't really see text messages, right? They can. And there are great cases. There was one going back probably six or seven years ago now where people who left one financial institution went to another one, basically tried to take their entire book of business. Uh, and all the evidence was in BlackBerry Messenger. And they were convinced that BlackBerry Messenger could not be searched and there would be no record of it. And of course, that case went to trial to appeal to Supreme Court. Uh, and all that evidence came back to haunt them. Believe it or not, we still have people who retain our firm because they want to get legal advice about a potential claim against their employer, and they are emailing us from their company email address. And when we call them on it, because I assume maybe it's just they didn't turn their minds to it, we'll call them. We don't respond by email. We call them and say, we can't correspond with you on your company email address. Your employer can see all of this. And you'd be amazed how often we still get pushback. And we're told, don't worry, they'll never look at it, it's fine. Uh, and we have to essentially cover our own behinds by writing them emails saying we cannot guarantee confidentiality if you're going to do that. People just underestimate the risks. They also underestimate the risk of throwing out old equipment. In episode 12 of Fire Away, uh, Ryan and I discussed, you know, what you do with old laptops, phones, tab tablets, etc., and the need to wipe them clean before you either give them to someone, sell them to someone, or put them out with the trash. Otherwise, anybody can go and take them and discover all of not only your personal information, but if you had company information on there, you are basically disclosing all of your corporate information to the detriment of, of your employer. Uh, so you need to be aware of that. Uh, people also still amaze me by the fact that they will go online, whether it's Facebook or Twitter or whatever it may be, and post things and assume it will never get back to their employer. And often the explanation I'm given is, well, I know that my boss, you know, I would never be friends with my boss on Facebook, so they can't see my posts. Guess what? When employers call us and they say, look, you know, we just found out that so-and-so was on a ski vacation last week when they claimed to be sick. Well, how did you find out? Here's the Facebook posts. And when we ask them how they got the Facebook posts, inevitably, it's somebody else at the company that was friends with them, saw the post, brought it to HR. So don't assume that anything you post online is not going to get back to your employer just because you're not friends or connections with them. So that's some of the things we see employees doing. From the employer perspective, we still see companies giving out devices, primarily smartphones, like candy, uh, without taking the time to put in place proper policies, proper procedures. And again, in episode 12 of Fire Away, Ryan and I discussed you know, what the things are that you should be doing in order to protect your corporate information and make sure everyone knows, A, what the rules are, and B, that you as a company or as an organization have the ability to control the data, wipe the data, et cetera. We also see employers who give out, or maybe they don't give out devices, maybe they're corporate devices, but they're not actually tracking what individuals are doing. They're not making any effort to make sure that people are not either copying company information, disclosing it, 
or sending it to themselves by Gmail, which I still see quite often, uh, or when the company becomes aware of some potential uh, disclosure, they think someone might be stealing information, copying information, et cetera. They go in and they do an amateur investigation. And when they do that, they basically destroy all the evidence. So when they finally get to me, I have to say, look, you know, we can try to deal with this, but the reality is we can't go to court because you went in, rather than hiring a professional, you went in, you gathered all this data, and basically what you did was you destroyed the evidence so we can't use it. So if you suspect that one of your employees is disclosing confidential information or doing anything else that would otherwise compromise your interests, first of all, contact your employment lawyer, but also contact an IT professional, someone who is an expert in cybersecurity. Don't try to do it yourself. Technology pervades pretty much every aspect of our lives, including work. As an employer, you can't bury your heads in the sand or try to do things cheap. I've seen companies who try to save $5,000, cost themselves $500,000 because they lost data, they lost customers. As an individual, you wouldn't make or leave copies of your confidential information in you know, the, the kitchen at work. So why would you put it on your work server? These are all the things you need to think about. Ultimately, these things end up on our desks when things go wrong, but it's amazing how people just continuously underestimate the risk technology brings. So that's really my, uh, my rant for today. And what I want to say is give it some thought and don't just either try to avoid costs or be lazy. Realize what you might be doing as far as your own confidential information or your company's confidential information and realize that if you don't want other people to see it, you need to lock it down properly. So that's my two cents worth, and uh, you got it here for free today. That's all the time we have for episode 12. I want to thank everyone for tuning in, uh, and I also want to thank my guest, Ryan Duquette, for a great discussion, which could have gone for another hour. Uh, I want to make everyone aware we have a slight change in schedule. So next month, our next episode will be Thursday, February 14th, Valentine's Day. Uh, and we'll be discussing tips and strategies for mediations with Toronto lawyer and mediator Mitchell Rose. If you have any questions about today's episode or suggestions for future ones, feel free to email us at info at rodnerlaw.ca. As I mentioned at the beginning, if you missed today's episode or missed previous episodes or want to watch it again, these episodes are always available online on Facebook or YouTube. Uh, and if you sign up for our newsletter, you'll get notifications about all the episodes. Uh, as I always say, Rudner Law believes in education. Shows like this, our newsletter, our blog, our LinkedIn feed, our Twitter feed, our LinkedIn group are all great sources of information. So please check them out. But also remember, none of this replaces legal advice. If you think you might need an employment lawyer, you probably do. Please don't hesitate to reach out to us. We'd be happy to talk to you. If we can help you, that's great. If we can't, there's no harm done. Uh, but please don't try to do it yourself. Lastly, thanks to Rob, to Rebecca, to Mark for helping putting on the show and making everything go as smoothly as it possibly can be. And uh, that's all for today. Thanks very much. Have a great day. 